For centuries, there was talk of this kingdom, but nobody could find it, nobody knew where it was. It's the last place on earth where you have pure Tibetan culture. Shielded by the tallest mountains on earth is a tiny hidden kingdom. Is Mustang Shangri-La? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, some people say Mustang is like a Shangri-La. It's like another planet, yeah. These are the Himalayas. I'm standing in Nepal. Chinese rule Tibet is that way, and India is over there. But sandwiched right in the middle, here on the rooftop of the world, is the ancient and mysterious kingdom known as Mustang. Where priceless treasures are hidden in crumbling temples and people live in fear of demons. It's a lost horizon, all but sealed off from the modern world. We time travel. We go back to the past. We're seeing something that was several hundred years ago. What a privilege. It's hard to imagine that people actually live in such a barren and inhospitable part of the world, but the people of Mustang do, and it's just over there. We arrive to the warmest of welcomes. Namaste. Yeah. Prince Raju Bista is our host. Nice to meet you, Raju. Okay. Welcome to Mustang. Thank and first so stop much. is his home village. And you have two children? Yeah, we have two. Gemi is a time capsule of the Middle Ages. Cobblestone alleyways, homes made of mud and straw, and peak hour is a gridlock of livestock. For more than 600 years, this place was forbidden to the world. Also with me is adventure correspondent Paul Raphael, one of the first Western journalists to reach Mustang two decades ago. How old is the village? Yeah, it's uh, more than 500 years old. But even older is the custom he wants me to see, one that has never been filmed before. A joint Mustang wedding. His name is Pema. Pema? Yeah. Both these brothers Namaste. are getting married today. Namaste. Yeah. Namaste. So to the same woman. Can you ask what they're most excited about? What they're looking forward to about the wedding? <laughs> did he say? Did he say the wedding night? Yeah. He did. He's exciting right. about the wedding night. Okay. <laughs> And this is the lucky bride, 25-year-old Karma. A lot of work to your husbands yeah. in Australia, we would say that. Yeah. Is she a hard worker? Uh, she's a very hard worker. <laughs> because Mustang is so tiny, just 80 kilometres long and 45 kilometres wide, brothers marry one wife to keep family-owned land from being divided up. If each son got a bit, they'd end up owning about that much of land. And so they have this tradition whereby the brothers get together, get a bride, and that's it. They live happily ever after. And they do too. Can you believe it or not? They do. And this is officially the moment when they become men and wife. Karma will spend the first three nights with the oldest brother, and then the younger brother has the next three nights with their bride. And so it goes for the rest of their married life.
The next morning, I'm on my way to my next destination, Mustang's capital, a two-day trek by pony. It's a harsh, dry, barren and brutal landscape, but it has this majestic, powerful quality that begs you to stop and just take it all in. The land is so dry because the Himalayas create a rain shadow over the kingdom. And for millennia, they've also been a natural barrier to the outside world. Foreigners enter the high terrain and thin air at their peril. We're now at 3,400 metres, which is very high, and altitude sickness can be a problem. We think that's what John Al Soundy is struggling with at the moment, so we're giving him some oxygen and hopefully he'll come good. When John is well enough, we continue on to the capital, Lo Montong, a walled city home to 1,200 people and Mustang's revered royal family. The king of Mustang hasn't been well. He's 78 years old, he's rarely seen in public and he hardly ever grants interviews. But today, we've been summoned to the palace. His palace is the tallest building in the capital. It's four storeys. Good morning. Namaste. With the king is his son, the crown prince. The next in line to the so throne. To that There's a shrine to the Dalai Lama, and the king has a dog, a Pekingese. And what's his name? Baktu. 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 <laughs> How important is Mustang to the rest of the world? My father's telling it is uh, very important. You know, we are culturally same as Tibet, and uh, as for Tibet now, it's a uh, you know a lot of modernization in Tibet, so I think it's very important. Mustang is an undisturbed sanctuary for Buddhist monks and their religion. When China invaded neighboring Tibet 60 years ago, Buddhist temples were the first to be hit, and the suppression and the attacks continue. Mustang for a long time, a few decades, has been a thorn in the side of China. Dalai Lama escaped through here. When Dalai Lama's troops were fighting back, Mustang was their base. From Mustang, they went into China on guerrilla raids for something like 10 years before it was stopped. Here it is, just across their border. They'd like to come across if they couldn't smash it and trash it. In a land where believing in evil spirits is commonplace, old ways remain a means of dealing with modern threats. The people of Mustang believe that without this ceremony, they'll face hardship and pain in the year to come. The dancing drives out ghosts and demons that have invaded not only Mustang, but the rest of the world. What we're witnessing is a medieval exorcism. This is the TG Festival, the kingdom's most important ceremony. It lasts for three days as masked monks perform a battle between good and evil. They have community, community spirit. We can see this in the festival of TG. They celebrate together, not individually like we do in our separate little homes and so on. They celebrate together. Because of the influence of foreigner, uh, men think, you know, in, uh, we should not lose our culture, religion and tradition. Is it very important to, to limit the Western influence in Mustang? Kind of, he's a little bit worried, but you know, <laughs> at the same time, you know, uh, he's telling that we're trying our best to keep our culture alive. The king lets in only a thousand foreigners a year. But no matter how hard they try, the Western world is creeping in. 
Traditionally, wealth here has been measured by the amount of firewood on your roof. But now other signs of prosperity are popping up. Solar panels, satellite dishes, a four-wheel drive on a brand new road. And, though it won't start, and there's no mechanic in town, a motorbike. What are some of the Western influences that threaten your culture? <laughs> Is that your phone? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is that your wife calling? <laughs> <laughs> In Mustang, there's a tricky balance underway between the new and the old. On the final day of TG, blasts from antique muskets signal the death of the demons. <laughs> Holy moly! <laughs> but in the long run, the firepower may be no match for the changes that are only now reaching this most remote corner of the world. Incredibly, Mustang has been able to hold on to this rich, ancient culture from the 14th century. But with the Western world gradually making inroads, the question is, for how much longer?